Okay, so now we'll pick up with the uh, discussion of climate finance and transportation. Okay, this um, picture right here is actually um, from uh, 1992. Um, this was taken in uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, at a big meeting, United Nations meeting, known as the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. Uh, it's also sometimes known as the Rio Summit or the Earth Summit. Um, and the uh, reason that you have this really interesting looking clip art growing out of there is this is also the meeting where we first started talking about uh, international climate change regime. Um, what would be negotiated out of this, agree out of this meeting was what, was what is known as the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. Okay, this was negotiated in 1992 and um, after that negotiation, it would take until 1994 until uh, enough countries would sign on to this for it to become absolutely official. And when it became absolutely official in 1994, then every year we would start to have a climate change meeting uh, known as the Conference of the Parties or COP. And uh, this is just a graph showing you uh, how many people attend these meetings. Uh, and for different years. So I'm going to highlight a few quick uh, points here. First of all, uh, COP3, uh, where we see a sort of um, significant increase, although not as high as previously, but still a significant increase in attendance from media, observers, and also the countries themselves. And uh, COP3 actually took place in Japan uh, in a city called Kyoto. Okay. So that'll help you fill in some of the details. Um, and uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about COP13, uh, which happened uh, in Bali, Indonesia, uh, which was also a very big event. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, and then uh, COP15, uh, which happened in uh, Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. Uh, very, very cold and uh, not very well organized. One of my colleagues had to stand outside waiting to get into the uh, venue for 12 to 13 hours before they turned him away. And it's much colder than it was in Japan or even Warsaw at that time. Okay. All right. Um, when I talk through here, uh, when I talk through these, uh, these different meetings, I want you to keep in the back of your head what do these meetings in uh, Kyoto or, or Bali or Copenhagen or the most recently completed meeting was in Warsaw, Poland. This picture is actually of the uh, national stadium uh, in Poland. And so you can see that these are, these are really big meetings. And there's a, a lot of people inside of that stadium talking about the uh, climate change negotiations. Uh, I believe about 10,000 people showed up for uh, the Warsaw meeting. Um, and uh, uh, people from all different parts of the world, uh, including uh, your national delegations. One of the things you might want to think about is try to, try to think who uh, handles the transportation issues uh, in these negotiations, because I think they, they need to have more communication with city level policymakers. Okay, then I'm going to just run you through a little bit of the sort of key points in terms of these climate negotiations to give you a sense of how transport might fit into this discussion. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, COP3, the third conference of the parties to the UNFCCC, um, happened in uh, Kyoto, um, Japan. Uh, there was um, a lot of negotiation. Typically, these meetings go for about two weeks or so. And typically, at the very end of the meeting, there's uh, some marathon session uh, where people don't get a lot of sleep and uh, stay up all hours of the night to try to make sure you can get some agreement. This happened in Warsaw most recently. Um, and the same thing actually happened in Kyoto. Uh, while I was not there at the time, uh, sp having spoken to some of my colleagues at IGES, uh, from what I understand, the Japanese Minister of the Environment uh, was actually on his way back to Tokyo um, and was going towards Kyoto Station when they stopped him and pulled him back and said, OK, we have some agreement now. Um, so there's a sort of a last minute type of thing. Um, and the uh, other interesting thing to note is the structure of these. Okay. So you have this UNFCCC, uh, and this is sort of like um, a platform or um, sort of superstructure. Uh, and within that platform or this superstructure, 
you have other agreements that get embedded inside of them. So this COP process, um, which starts with the UNFCCC, helps us to negotiate smaller and narrower protocols or agreements within the context of the larger structure. Okay, the key thing about the Kyoto Protocol um, is it was relatively what we call top-down in structure. What I mean by that is the um, main features of the agreement were uh, targets and timetables. Targets meaning uh, developed countries basically said that they would reduce their emissions um, on average by 5% off of 1990 levels by 2000, between 2008 and 2012. This would apply to six different greenhouse gases. Um, and after those negotiations were finished, then developed countries went back and tried to figure out a way to actually meet these targets. Um, some other important points that you might recognize. Uh, although the United States was actively involved in negotiation of the Kyoto Protocol, it never ratified the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and uh, this is a big challenge for me, especially coming from the United States. Uh, at the same time, um, major uh, developing countries, because they were developing and because um, there was a, a, this notion of common but differentiated responsibilities, so major developing countries did not have targets and timetables. Um, and uh, so you had a relatively top-down process that applied mostly to developed countries with these targets and timetables. But there was a surprise element that came out of Kyoto. And uh, this surprise element is known as the Clean Development Mechanism, or CDM, Clean Development Mechanism. And what was interesting about this is when these negotiations were going on, there was a push from many developed countries, but led by the United States, um, to have some mechanism in the Kyoto Protocol that would allow developed countries to buy emission reductions from developing countries. What I mean by that is basically, if you could have a project in a developing country context that reduces your greenhouse gases, the amount of greenhouse gases that were reduced could be purchased by developed countries and then applied to their own target. Okay? And the thinking behind this is a lot of times it's cheaper to reduce emissions in developing countries than it is in developed countries. So that was part of the push. The US wanted to have this mechanism which would focus on projects a little bit more from the bottom up. At the same time, Brazil was pushing for what they wanted called a clean technology fund. And what Brazil wanted was a funding mechanism that would make sure that uh, technologies, clean technologies, could be financed in developing countries, usually at low rates, concessional rates. And it wasn't emphasizing a market mechanism. They wanted to make sure that these technologies promoted sustainable development, were good for the overall development of their country. Um, at the same time, it could also reduce greenhouse gases. So the idea then from Brazil and US was sort of put together in this what's called CDM. And CDM, on one hand, the, one of the goals is to allow developed countries to purchase uh, lower cost emission reductions. But on the other hand, it's also supposed to promote development or sustainable development in developing countries. So it's supposed to achieve both of these goals. Whether it's done that depends upon your, your view on these things. Um, it's been a struggle in the transportation sector. Um, and this is partially because the way that the CDM is supposed to work is in order for developed countries to buy your emission reductions, what they would call certified emission reductions or CERs, these credits, in order for you to do that, what you have to demonstrate is a business as usual baseline and then um, a with project uh, trajectory. And this red, what we see right here, this uh, sort of red shaded area, um, the difference between having the project and not having the project would then be the amount of uh, GHGs that you could uh, potentially reduce. And assuming you go through the entire process, which uh, Toto will talk about in more detail, 
assuming that you're able to go through that process, um, then you could then sell those credits, and those, that money then would come back to, um, to the uh, project proponent, the person who's supporting the project. <coughs> OK, the important thing to highlight here is, in theory, that's how it's supposed to work. And it actually worked well for many sectors. Um, in particular, the renewable energy sector has done quite well. Um, it's worked pretty well for uh, methane, uh, especially from uh, coal mines, but also from uh, waste management. Um, and the energy sectors, it's done OK. Um, in terms of the transportation sector, uh, we'll, I believe Toto will give you the exact figure, but there's over uh, 7,800 7, projects, I think, uh, right now in the pipeline. And about 50 or so are in transportation. Very, very small percentage. And up to a few years ago, it was more like three or four. Um, having said all that, uh, we have learned some valuable lessons from the CDM and how you might measure and report and verify emissions from transportation. And Toto will talk a little bit more about those. Um, so it hasn't been totally um, a, a waste of time for transportation. We have learned some valuable things. Um, at the same time, we've bumped into a lot of barriers. So it's some of the reasons that it's been really difficult for transport. Um, so the amount of GHGs that you would typically reduce from a transportation project, um, because it's uh, really, really small to, relative to the amount of money you actually need to invest in that project, has made it difficult for transportation to compete with other projects where the amount that you would get is much greater. Um, and so part of this has been, um, especially in a competitive market where there's all different types of sectors, uh, transport hasn't competed very well against other sectors. And uh, this low revenue relative to investment is part of the issue. Another, another issue is, as we've talked about, um, a lot of transportation projects are led by the public sector, although that might be in a PPP, uh, uh, um, uh, type of relationship, um, the uh, investment typically for these projects, uh, especially in the energy sector, has typically gone to a private investor. And so it's difficult for a public sector uh, organization to claim the investment from, uh, from the CDM. Um, the last two issues is something that we're going to get into in a lot more detail as we move forward. But the, and they're, they're there's something I'm sure that you've experienced too, is that when we want to actually measure the emissions and to do this baseline, we have a lot of small sources in the transportation sector. Um, and because of those small sources, it's difficult to generate these baselines. And in addition to that, it raises the transaction costs. It makes it more expensive to develop a project. And that also makes it less competitive with other sectors. Okay, so some key messages. Uh, basically, the Kyoto Protocol was developed out of the UNFCCC. Uh, it started out with a very sort of top-down structure with targets and timetables for developed or Annex 1 countries. Um, though the CDM was uh, more bottom-up in orientation, uh, still the structure of the CDM did not fit that well with the transportation sector. So we'll talk a little bit more about this, but uh, I'm going to just stop right now for some, see if there's any, uh, any questions on, on in terms of CDM or in terms of the negotiations. I'll talk a little bit more about climate negotiations in the next section, but just want to stop right there for a second. <laughs>